भद्रम कर्णे भी शृणुयाम देवा भद्रम पश्येमाक्षभीजत्रा स्थिरंगुष्टवागुम सस्तनु व्यशेम देवित यदायु स्वस्ति न इंद्रो वृद्धश्रवा स्वस्ति न पूषा विश्व स्वस्ति नस्ताक्षो अरिष्टनेमी स्वस्ति नो बृहस्पतिर्दा ओ शाति 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 ट्रांसलेशन इज ओम ओ गॉड्स मे वी हियर ऑस्पिशियस वर्ड्स विद आर इयर्स वेल एंगेज इन सैक्रिफाइसिस मे वी सी ऑस्पिशियस थिंग्स विद आर आईज while praising the gods with steady limbs may we enjoy a life that is beneficial to the gods may indra of ancient fame be auspicious to us may the all knowing pusha god of the earth be propitious to us may garuda the destroyer of evil be well disposed towards us may bihaspati ensure our welfare om peace 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 was just reminded the importance of stillness so here there is a, a phrase used sthirai uh, rangehi it means uh, with uh, strong healthy long lasting you know limbs and sense organs and all, all of that which is necessary for any kind of religion any kind of uh, spirituality in fact any kind of worldly activity of course uh, but sthira also means steady not restless not shaky i was just reminded many many years ago this was over 30 years ago when i had just joined the order as a as a novice we were sitting down we used to sit on a mat on the floor to study and uh, the swami who was teaching us one day i remember a, fr- a friend of mine another novice is sitting and fidgety you know sort of uh, shaking and the swami immediately sharply scolded him he said stop that it means still stilai rangehi the the mind is so delicately balanced that any shaking of the body um, it, it disturbs the mind it's like a bowl of water uh, if you shake the bowl even even if your hand trembles a little bit the water moves a lot so you have to hold it really carefully therefore physical stillness uh, i've seen in many of the senior monks those advanced practitioners this quality of stillness all right now where were we we were on the very end of the mundaka almost the end of the mundaka upanishad which is the third chapter the chapters are called mundakas and each chapter has um two sections so we were towards the end of the first section of the third chapter and the verse that we were doing is um a the eighth verse we did the eighth verse last time but just to catch up because i was away the eighth verse goes like this eight mantra न चक्षुषा गृह्यते नाने दपसा कर्म व्ञानप्रसाद विशुद्ध सततस्तुत पश्य निष्क ध्यायम वट डज दिस् मीन सो दिस् चैप्टर इट टाक्स अबाउट दि preliminary preparations or practices necessary for enlightenment uh, practices like ethical life and austerity and concentration of mind you know truth self control the de- uh, strength moral physical strength emotional strength the so strength all of these things uh, are uh, important for uh, as preparatory as foundational for enlightenment for spiritual life also uh, here it says that because of the extreme uh, subtlety of the atman what we are trying to realize 
and that's being pointed out. And the chapter also will talk about the results of uh, self-knowledge a little later. So what is being pointed out because the extreme subtlety of the Atman. Um, you cannot realize, you cannot know this Atman, our real nature, with your eyes. Of course, you cannot see it. Um, somebody asked me, in fact, just today, somebody asked me that uh, this pure consciousness we talk about, is it ever possible to have, uh, um, you know, experience of that? Now, clearly, what you mean by experience of that is somewhere inside us, is this is what we are experiencing. See, we're seeing it. So can we experience it like that? Obviously, the questioner did not mean something as crude as seeing it with the eyes. But the principle is the same. You cannot objectify it because it is the very nature of the subject. It's the essence of the reality of the subject. Not not by the eyes and by extension, none of the sense organs. It says, not by the any other. The devatas here refer to the other sense organs. Devatas means literally the gods, uh, small g. But here it refers to the various sense powers. So yes, the self cannot be seen, heard, smelt, tasted, touched. Napi vacha. It cannot be uh, revealed by, by speech. So we have discussed this. It comes up once in a while. That how is, how is the real nature of the Atman, pure consciousness, beyond speech and beyond mind. You cannot speak about it. You cannot um, think about, conceive of it. Um, and why we cannot speak about it, I've also mentioned um, what is necessary for speech to operate and why those characteristics are not present in the featureless, attributeless, uh, pure consciousness. And also, uh, you know, when we use words like Atman, pure consciousness, um, Brahman, we fail to refer. Refer means when I use a word like um, a notebook, I mean this. When I use a word like cloth, I mean this. So it refers, the word refers to something. So when you say pure consciousness, um, Atman, Brahman, what is it that you're referring to? The words themselves will not directly refer to anything. It has to be caught. So language is used here in a very strategic way in, um, in the Upanishads. So multiple strategies are adopted to refer to something that cannot be directly referred to, to indicate something. So, if you cannot speak about the Atman, at least you can say what it is not. If you can't say what it is, you can say what it is not. The famous neti neti, not this, not this uh, approach. Or paradoxical language is sometimes used. Or implication is sometimes used. Or um, um, stories are sometimes used to, uh, to indicate our real nature. Multiple techniques are used where language fails. Karmanava. None of the Vedic sacrificial rituals, the Vedic rituals which those people were used to, what they normally thought of as religion, none of them will help you to, will, will show you the real nature of the self. None of them will lead to enlightenment. Then, what will help? Purification of the mind. It says, Vishuddha Sattva, purified mind. Um, so what it actually practically means is everything that was uh, rejected in the in this first line the religious practices austerities uh, control of the senses those might not directly reveal the atman to you but uh, religious practices moral practices all of them are essential to prepare the mind what will they do they will give us purity of mind then purity of mind you combine it with Vedantic instruction, these teachings of the Upanishads. A, a competent teacher, you study the texts and then contemplate on it, then get clarity and meditate. So, Shravana Manana Nidhi Dhyasana uh, of Vedanta with a prepared mind. Prepared mind is a purified mind. And purification of the mind, all the other practices, um, you know, uh, truth, strength of mind, purity of mind, uh, self-control, uh, austerities, all of them become relevant. So just because it says by religious rituals you cannot become enlightened, one shouldn't abandon one's spiritual practices, you know, or even devotional practices. All of them are useful. Now, 
jnana prasadina so what is proximally useful what will directly lead to enlightenment jnana prasadena by a purified mind in which knowledge arises how will knowledge arise by the use of uh, the of vedanta by shravana manana nididhyasana by listening to the vedantic teachings by thinking carefully about it and then once clarity is gained staying with that clarity shankaracharya here to explain jnana prasadena he explains how purity of mind and vedanta operate together to give enlightenment he gives the example two nice examples um, that of the mirror and that of the water so in both one can see the reflection of one's face and he gives a, it's a very nice example because one's face is always present the present face is always present but to see the face um, it's not enough to just have the face present you need a mirror and it's not enough to just have the mirror you have to clean the mirror then only the face is reflected there so to experience to to realize who i am you need the mind although the mind cannot directly see it but you need the mind and the mind has to be purified another example he gives is of of water you can see your face in the water but the water needs to be steady and he gives that example and then he gives the contrary the problems he says a dirty mirror will not reflect or reflect properly or he says restless water water which is breaking out into ripples that will not reflect it will break up the reflection he has given this uh, very nice example he says atma avabodhana samarthyam api swabhavena sarva praninam gyanam he says um, self realization the mind is possible mind is capable of attaining enlightenment atma gyana self realization um swabhavena naturally capable because the mind is naturally capable mirror is naturally capable of reflecting uh, our face um and in his sarva praninam of all beings he doesn't even say of all human beings uh, he says of all beings the mind is capable um then but what's the problem bahya vishaya ragaadi dosha kalushitam aprasanna mashuddham san navabodhayati once if the mind is polluted uh, is conditioned by attraction and repulsion he says spe- specifically attraction to um, sense objects of things in, in the world once it's pulled outwards then it becomes incapable of revealing to us our real nature nityam sannihitam api he says although it's constantly most proximally present all the time like our face is present the ma- the mirror which is capable of naturally capable of reflecting my face but once it gets a coating of dust it ca- it cannot uh, it's obstructed although the face is constantly present so that's the beautiful thing about vedanta what we are talking about here what we are trying to realize here is constantly available to us is <laughs> saying that the best things in life are always free so uh, sunlight and air and water and um you know just nature all of it is free but uh, and so also even more so freely all the time without condition available is the highest realization the greatest fulfillment of human life and you know that's really fair of god all the lesser and useless things you can struggle for you can attain for some time and then lose it um, things in the world you know people and uh, relationships and money and success and power and wealth life itself will come and go they are lesser things much lesser things the highest thing is all the time available to us that is atman or brahman and that's a great comfort even if i do not see it's a great comfort to know that um, brahman the atman of my real nature is constantly unconditionally effortlessly directly available to us all the effort is to clean the mirror bisway vivekananda says in one place um rather cryptically all we can do is polish the mirror all we can do is polish the mirror and this is what he means sannihitam api it's constantly present it's not separated from you by space it's uh, it's right here it's not separated from you by time you don't have to wait for it it's right now and it's not something else it's you
मला अनवद्धम मला अवनद्धम सॉरी मला अवनद्धम अब्स्ट्रक्टेड कवर्ड बाय इम्प्युरिटीज इव सो ही सेज एज इफ लाइक अ मिरर कवर्ड बाय डर्ट देन ही गिव्स अनदर एग्जाम्पल विलुलितम इव सलीलम डिस्टर्ब एज इट वे आर द वॉटर्स you look into the waters and see want to see your face you cannot because it's uh, shaking it's uh, uh, someone is fidgeting if you, if you fidget the body <laughs> then he goes on to say once the um the attraction for external objects the the actually the disturbance created in the mind by the attraction for an external objects the restlessness of the mind these are removed that is called gyana prasada um, so the purity of the mind leading to the rising of self knowledge so then that leads to self knowledge and then he says what do you see then pashyati he says sees sees of course quote and quote because you don't actually see he just denied that you cannot see it by the eyes so you don't actually see you know but you don't actually really know it by the mind it's called brahmakara vritti the arising of the mental modification uh, about the true nature of of uh, the atman where that mental modification destroys our ignorance about the atman and the atman is ever shining so it gets revealed it's just like lifting a veil and the reality is already there yeah that's a good good example all our efforts and the final moment of illumination what the mind does is it basically lifts the veil it does not reveal the truth it lifts the veil the truth is always available not only available always shining for the always self revealed from the side of the truth from the side of atman from the side of brahman nothing has none remains to be done brahman is doing all it can atman our real nature is doing all it can to show itself to us it's we who have complicated things and we require effort to so to to see ourselves as it sounds paradoxical but that's the way it is nishkalam the partless it, it, here the ultimate reality our nature is called nishkalam partless um, partless means uh, the technically it means uh, swagata vijatiya sajatiya bheda rahita devoid of the threefold difference threefold difference this atman brahman there is um nothing other than it so vijati abheda so maybe so there is a book here is a book and uh, there are other things the table and the chair and the person they are all other than the book this is called vijati abheda difference of dissimilar things so there are no dissimilar things but there is only the atman the second kind of difference is one might say okay there is the atman but there are are there many atmans there is only consciousness but there are there many consciousnesses um, no sajati abheda the difference of similar kinds so there is this is a book surely but this is also another book uh, and uh, is it like that are there many a book like many books are there many atmans no there is only the same one atman so swagata abheda all right Uh, but within the atman just like within this book there are pages different pages within the atman or 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 say within the same table it has a top it has a bottom it has four legs within the atman are there different parts is has does consciousness have parts in this refers to vishishta advaita uh, they will say yes but here it says no nishkalam it has no parts at all uh, it has it's one homogeneous pure consciousness so this is what partless means devoid of the three kinds of difference difference within itself ultimate reality has no internal difference within itself no parts and then there's no part or whole relationship there second there are no multiple ultimate realities there's only one and third um there is nothing other than that ultimate reality so these three kinds of differences are denied this is a denial of the three negation of the three kinds of differences it's all of that is packed into one word 
ultimate reality is nishkalam, partless. Dhyayamana, being meditated upon. So Shankaracharya says Dhyayamana means the mind purified by ethical practices and internalized, turned inwardized and concentrated, ekagrena manasa. Dhyayamana literally means meditation. Here he translates it as anuchintayan, thinking after. Thinking after. What is thinking after? Um, first you hear it, study it, get the knowledge from the, you know what, what the Upanishads are talking about. Second, uh, remove all doubts so the intellect has absolute clarity about what we are talking about here. And then stay with that absolute clarity. That is Vedantic meditation. Shankaracharya, he says, it's just anuchinta. It, it's like Careful and deep, sustained thinking. The thinking, not in the sense of a rational inquiry, which is the f second step, which is mananam. But that's already done. Now clarity has been attained. What you have attained clarity with, stay with that. That is called dhyaya mana. So this is the eighth mantra. We've already done this, but I just wanted to bring forth, I don't remember if I brought the, forth the, um, the lake example, the water example and the mirror example. Shankaracharya uses those two beautiful examples. And those examples are instructive. The mirror by itself is capable of reflecting the face, but not when it is covered by dust. Similarly, the mind by itself is capable of attaining enlightenment quite easily, but not when it is impure. So purification of the mind is uh, indicated here, like, like polishing the mirror. The other problem with, the, with uh, the mind when it seeks enlightenment is restlessness of the mind. And that is shown by the restless waters. The water you can ref automatically reflect our face, but not when it is breaking out into ripples and waves. The water is stilled. Um, the mirror is polished. So the mind is purified and the mind is calmed, stilled, stilled and inwardized not flowing out continuously, then it is ready for enlightenment. This is what is meant by preparation, by purification of the mind. Now, the next mantra, number nine. Esho anuratma chetasa veditavyo yasmin prana panchadasam vivesha prane chittam sarvam otam prajanam Yasmin Vishuddhe Vibhavatyesha Atma. Let me just read the English translation from Swami Gambhiranandaji. Within the heart, in the body, with, where the vital forces entered in five forms, is this subtle self to be realized through that intelligence by which is pervaded the entire mind as well as the motor and sensory organs of all creatures. And it is to be known in the mind, uh, which is, which, uh, which having become purified, this self reveals itself distinctly. Okay. Esha Anuratma. What are we talking about? Here the self is described as Anu. Anu literally means atom. Uh, tiny, but here it doesn't mean tiny because the self has, we have already realized it's, uh, we have already been taught it's limitless, it's vast it, um, it's vaster than the entire universe the poet Emily Dickinson she writes the brain in itself is greater than the sky it's vaster than the sky I'm, I'm paraphrasing, I've forgotten the actual language she doesn't mean the physical brain. She means consciousness. It is vaster than the sky. Because it is in consciousness, the sky and the earth and people, the great and the small are all seen, are all experienced. We think that doesn't make sense because the sky is outside and it's really big. So what if it is seen in consciousness? It's outside and it's seen. But Vedanta says it's not outside. It's not outside. It is uh, appeared. The whole thing is... Uh, an appearance in consciousness. As the Tibetan Buddhists put it, very nice language, they say, uh, 
like a magical display, a dream-like appearances on the primordial ground. Dream-like appearances on the primordial ground. Yes. Rick is prompt as ever. He has uh, given us the poem. Beautiful poem. The brain is wider than the sky, for put them side by side. The one the other will contain with ease and you beside. <laughs> Consciousness will contain you and the sky. <laughs> the brain is deeper than the sea, for hold them blue to blue. The one the other will absorb as sponges buckets do. <laughs> the brain is just the weight of God. Beautiful. For heft them pound for pound. And they will differ if they do a syllable from sound. <laughs> Beautifully done. It's so Vedantic. It, it even, even ends with the identity of the self and God. The brain and God, it says, it, it weighs as much as, as, uh, as God. Uh. So, Anu, it's tiny. Tiny, it's not tiny in that sense of the, of the little. It's actually vast, but it's uh, Anu in the sense of subtle. Just as, a, as an atom is subtle, it's, it's very subtle. It's not a physical thing. It's not a vital thing. It's not a mental thing. It's not an intellectual concept. It's nothing. It's not nothing either. It's subtler than nothing. <laughs> it hides behind, behind the veil of nothingness. Esha Anuratma. How then how do we how are we supposed to realize it, know it at all? The Swami Vivekananda says it's not something that can be known, but it's don't go away with the idea that it is unknown. It's more than known. Chetasavitabya. It has to be realized through the mind, the prepared mind. What and what is the preparation? We've already seen. Purified and concentrated. It must be purified of impurities, and the restlessness of the mind must be stilled. Yasmin prana panchada sam vivesha. In which body? Here, he is drawing our attention to the body. Um, and he says, in this body, pay attention to the body. Then, where the pranas course through this body, in a living body, prana. Prana is the vital forces. And panchada, fivefold. So we have read in Vedanta Sara, the fivefold prana. Basically, five functions of the vital forces. Prana, apana, vyana, udana, samana. So these um, five functions of the, uh, of the vital forces uh, which keep this body alive. Um, then it says, Prani chittam sarvam otam prajanam of all living beings, the vital forces, the senses, the mind, they're all pervaded by this one consciousness. Basically, one consciousness is reflected in the subtle body. The technical terms which we use, physical body, subtle body, causal body. So the whole consciousness, of course, pervades everything, but it is particularly reflected in the uh, what is called the uh, subtle body. Uh, so again, all these sound is esoteric, but if you take a look, each of us, if you just look inside, yes, we feel sentient. We all feel aware. This awareness is not pure consciousness. It arises and it uh, waxes and wanes and it disappears every day. This, this awareness which we have right now, um, it is uh, the consciousness reflected in the, uh, in the waking mind. When the mind goes to sleep, consciousness will be reflected in the uh, dreaming mind. But the, when the mind goes to deep sleep, then the reflected consciousness also uh, does not, is not functional anymore. But that's why we feel awareness is gone. Yes, this reflected awareness is gone temporarily. But pure consciousness is always there. Now, here it says that the consciousness is reflected in the subtle body, uh, in our uh, mind and intellect and senses everywhere. That's it's pointing to something we are all aware of right now. Yasmin vishuddhe vivavatyesha atma in which purified and concentrated mind. Vishuddha means concentrated mind. Vibhavatyesha atma, the self, this self, the pure self, the very subtle self, uh, the self which is as subtle as an atom, but as vast, as, he said, as she said, as the sky and as deep uh, as uh, the ocean, 
and as heavy, as hefty as God, <laughs> that consciousness will be revealed in the prepared mind, the purified mind. It says, Vibhavati shines forth. Um, there, the, we have to see here what is being indicated. The Brahmakara Vritti, which I mentioned earlier, this is being indicated here. The moment of enlightenment, what exactly happens? How is self-knowledge, enlightenment, different from other knowledge? So what is knowledge from a Vedantic perspective? Um, what happens in, in knowledge, any kind of knowledge, when we see, hear, smell, taste, and so on, when we think, when we understand, what's happening? What's happening is you know, that um, when I take up any object, like a book, so the eyes focus on the book, and there is a um, britti, a wave in the mind, about the book, about what I'm reading, or not just a wave, a continuous series of waves in the mind about what I'm reading. And the consciousness, which is always there, pure consciousness, you yourself, you are reflected in the mind as the reflected consciousness, that illumines the waves in the mind. So when the waves in the mind about what we are reading, uh, how, how did it come about? Through the eyes, information comes, and then the mind breaks out into waves, um, you know, processing that information, those um, waves are illumined by the consciousness already reflected there. And that gives us knowledge. So two things are necessary for ordinary knowledge, all kinds of knowledge which we have in the world. When we are continuously operating in the world, we have all kinds of knowledge. It requires the mind to be focused on the object of knowledge. Uh, mind, Basically, the mind to be thinking about the object of knowledge and the reflected consciousness there to illumine the movements of the mind. So when the mind um, objectifies the object of knowledge, thinks about it, focuses on it, a vritti, and technically there is a vritti. This vritti means, this vritti technically is called vritti vyapti. The mind pervades, literally it means the mind pervades the object of uh, knowledge. Whatever you are trying to know, the mind pervades it means the mind is thinking about it. Now, little footnote here, that um, you know, traditional Vedantic epistemology will say, the mind goes out through the senses and actually pervades the object of knowledge. We will not go into those. Um, it's more theological than uh, uh, epistemologically convincing. But what we are just saying, the mind is thinking about what we are uh, trying to know. The moment the mind thinks about whatever you're trying to know, there's a particular wave and the wave has for its content. The mind has it for its content, the object of knowledge. So far, so good. But the direct experience of, I know this, I understand this, I am reading this, the kind of experience we are all having all the time. This experience comes from the reflected consciousness. The reflected consciousness is there, and then it reveals, it illumines the wave in the mind. So when the reflected consciousness illumines the wave in the mind with its content, this is called halabhyapti, pervasion by consciousness. So, putting it together, all knowledge from a Vedantic perspective, any kind of knowledge, has these two components. Vritti Vyapti, pervasion by the mind, literally meaning thinking by the mind, mind focusing on whatever you want to know. And Palab Vyapti, pervasion by reflected consciousness. These two things are necessary. And I remember, the reflected consciousness, of course, implies that pure consciousness is always present. Now, what about enlightenment? In enlightenment, we are not trying to know a book or a flower or something in the, in the world or even the body. In enlightenment, we are trying to realize pure subject itself, which is not an object. So the mind, when it is well trained by Vedanta, when it is inwardized, we'll see the process of inwardization now. When it's inwardized, then it finally settles upon its real nature. Uh, it cannot objectify, but that moment of non-objective, sort of intuitive realization um, that comes and the reflected consciousness is no longer necessary to reveal it because now you're talking about, now you're trying to realize something that is self-luminous, consciousness itself. All other things are objects to consciousness. As long as we want, the forms are objects, sounds are objects, smell, taste, flavor, all of these are objects. And when we try to understand them, even concepts are objects. 
memories are objects, desires are objects. To know them, we need the mind plus the reflected consciousness. But the original consciousness itself, pure consciousness itself is not an object and it does not require reflected consciousness to, reveal, to, be, to be known or to be revealed. Let's say not to be known, to be revealed. It's like the sunlight. To, and with the help of the sunlight, the eyes can see everything in the world. Now, um, you know, the, the example would be when we reflect the sunlight. I've given the example of a mirror or a, or a steel plate by which we reflect the sunlight and the reflected beam goes into a dark corner of the room and shows us what's there in the world. But the sun itself. You don't need to reflect the sunlight from a, you know, like a polished mirror or, or a surface back to the sun to see the sun. The sun is blazing forth with millions of times more light than that. And even the reflected light is the light of the sun. So you, to realize, to, to know yourself as pure consciousness, you need to turn the mind and focus it with the help of purification and Vedanta. And then you, the Atman, will reveal yourself to yourself which is going on all the time, which is all the time available. We're just, so what, in another way, what Vedanta is doing, what does the mind do? It removes the veil of ignorance. And in normal cases, the mind removes the veil of ignorance and the reflected consciousness gives us knowledge. If something is hidden behind a veil, we need the hand to remove the veil, then the eyes will see. Similarly, the Atman is hidden by the veil of ignorance, not a physical veil. You need the mind to remove that veil. Uh, and uh, then consciousness reveal is always self-revealed. You don't need uh, reflected consciousness anymore in this case. So that is the meaning of Vibhavatyesha Atma. For those who remember the technical terms, Vritti Vyapti Falabhyapti, for ordinary knowledge, Vritti Vyapti and Falabhyapti both are necessary. Pervasion by mind, pervasion by reflected consciousness. For enlightenment, for the realization of Atman or Brahman, self-knowledge, only Vritti Vyapti, pervasion by mind is necessary. Uh, what is that? How do you get that? Through the Shravana, Manana, and Nididhyasana. Through the uh, study and con uh, you know, hearing of Vedanta, through contemplation, uh, reasoning and contemplation, and through meditation. So only Vritti Vyapti is necessary. But Phalabhyapti, reflected consciousness, is not necessary. That's why, again and again, you will find across the Upanishads, across Vedanta, it is beyond the mind. The mind cannot reach there. Yes, in what sense is it beyond the mind? In the sense that Phalabhyapti, reflected consciousness, is not necessary. But sometimes you will find in the Upanishads, only by the mind it can be known. Here, throughout the Upanishad, it keep, here, throughout this particular Upanishad, it keeps saying, in that purified mind it is reflected or in the purified mind it is, in, uh, it is realized. That means by the mind it can be known. It says by the pure mind it can be known. So it can be known by the pure mind. How do you reconcile these two contradictory statements? It can be known by the mind, it cannot be known by the mind. It cannot be known by the mind technically because Palabhyapti um, is not necessary. Pervasion by reflected consciousness is not necessary. Uh, and uh, it can be known by the mind because vritti vyapti is necessary. Pervasion by the mind is necessary. Yeah. Here is Shankaracharya's commentary. Yasminscha chitte, in that mind, kleshadi malai vyukte shuddhe, in the purified mind. What is purified? When all the negativities, desires, repulsions, um, they have been scrubbed clean, they have been purified. Vibhavati blazes forth, shines. Ukta Atma, said, the, the said Atman, the said self, which has been mentioned so far, which has been taught so far. How does it blaze forth? It's an important point he makes. Visheshena Svena Atmana Vibhavati. As I am that, it doesn't blaze forth as this is pure consciousness. Oh, now I see Brahman. No, now this Brahm, this is Brahman. I find, I found it. It's just like poking around in the body. A doctor is uh, finds the liver or the heart or the kidney. Now I have found Brahman. No, no, no. It's not like a memory when you are thinking. I just can't recall it. Oh, I've got it now. I located that that uh, and the memory. It comes to mind now. No, not like that. Uh, it it shines forth as. I am this. Right now it's shining forth also. But as 
I am this body. I am this person. I am just this guy. Then it will shine forth as I am this pure consciousness. And you appreciate its limitlessness. It is its non-duality. It's constancy. It's problem-free nature. And that's it. Then it's done. Sri Ramakrishna put it so simply. He said, Bodhe Bodhkara. Awareness of awareness. Or realization of consciousness in consciousness. In technical terms, he is pointing to uh, the, the unnecessary uh, reflected consciousness. The reflected consciousness is not necessary for enlightenment. Mm -hmm. All right. The last mantra of this section. Number 10. Yam yam lokam manasasam vibhati vishuddha sattva kama yate yangscha kaman tam tam lokam jayate tangscha kaman tasmad atmagyam hyachayet bhuti kamaha. There's a very poetic and melodious quality to this uh, Upanishad. What's happening in this uh, particular mantra? It's talking about the results of self-knowledge and why the enlightened one should be adored and revered, worshipped, the enlightened one. The man of pure mind wins those worlds which he mentally wishes for and those enjoyable things which he covets. Therefore, one desirous of prosperity should adore the knower of the self. Now, just as in religion, God is adored and worshipped for two things. One is whatever people want, you know, worldly desires. People want you know, to be cured of illness or to be saved from problems in the world. People want wealth and prosperity and success in learning, in relationships, whatever. In politics, going to heaven after death. All of these are worldly or otherworldly desires. And for that one worships God. And the one who is seeking enlightenment worships God for enlightenment. In Just like that, whether one wants worldly success and prosperity, or especially one wants, wants enlightenment, one should uh, adore and revere the enlightened one. One should adore and revere him. It indicates the adoration and reverence for the guru, the spiritual master here. So that's what's being indicated here. Also the results of enlightenment. And it's put in a very attractive way. It says, so what good is all this? It says, good is, what good is all this is, is that you get whatever you want. The enlightened one will get whatever he or she wants. Um, so that sounds very nice. That's what I've been looking for. Yeah, you can get all of it, whatever you want in this world, in the next world, whatever you can you can desire, every world you will get. And in those worlds, whatever you want, you will, you will get. So that's the uh, result. Yeah. So it's put in the way, you know, the Upanishad understands our uh, psychology. That at, at heart, we are kids. And we basically are seeking to satisfy what we want, like impulsive we want to fulfill our impulsive desires. So it says, Yam yam lokam manasa samvibhati. Whatever the enlightened one might contem contemplate, whatever world, human world, the worlds of um, the fathers, the worlds of you know, various heavens, up to the world of Brahma. Kama yate yangscha kama. And whatever desirable object, you know, whatever it there is, you, know, you can available on Amazon Prime. So, I'm just joking. One might think that, well, whatever is on Amazon Prime, I can get it too. I don't need enlightenment for that. True. But uh, whatever the means to get anything in this world and in the next world, one has to work so hard in order to earn money. And to get money, one has to earn karmic merit in order to be rich and healthy and well-to-do and good, happy relationships in this world requires a lot of good karma. Now, the enlightened one can have all of that um, in a blink of an eye, just what is by called sankalpa, by thinking of it. 
Now the enlightened one does not want any of it. Why should he? It is all dreamlike for the enlightened one. Then what? Then what's the point? Here is the point. Here is the um, point of the entire mantra. You who we who are not enlightened by adoration of the enlightened one, by reverence to the enlightened one, our desires will be fulfilled. So the enlightened one has this capacity of fulfilling the desires, has no desires of his or her own. We might think, what a waste. I've got lots of desires, but without the capacity to fulfill them. And that one has the capacity to fulfill them easily, but doesn't have any of those desires. So, uh, so Shiva, for example, is depicted as being a yogi without any wealth, uh, you know, doesn't live in a palace, lives on an icy mountain top, uh, doesn't have a nice sofa to sit on, just has a tiger skin, um, is dressed in the most austere dress. Shivaratri is coming tomorrow, day after tomorrow. Uh, so, and yet, Shiva can, can fulfill all our desires. So people worship Shiva for worldly desires. Uh, the millions of people who will worship Shiva day after tomorrow, uh, millions, hundreds of millions across India and, and now across the world also, not all of them are looking for enlightenment. Uh, very few of them actually are. Many of them are looking for some kind of worldly pro, uh, result. I lived for uh, several years in one of the most ancient, uh, uh, near one of the most ancient Shiva temples. It was called Vaidyanath Dham, in a place called Jharkhand in India, eastern India. So once in a year, there is a huge uh, uh, pilgrimage. And uh, millions of people come there. Millions of people come from all over India, Nepal, and nowadays from abroad uh, to visit that ancient Shiva temple, Vaidyanath Dham. And there is tremendous power there. Those who have gone there, just like many of the ancient uh, pilgrimage sites in India, there is tremendous power. You can feel it. You can just go in there. It's um, at the last time I went, I think it was last year or year before last, I went there to India and visited because our ashram there completed 100 years and there was a big celebration and we were invited. And we went on pilgrimage to that Shiva temple. So thousands of people, it's very crowded, very noisy. It's not like a Buddhist meditation hall at all. It's just the opposite. There are thousands and thousands of people all the time, ceaselessly. Almost day and night, I mean, only that very late in the night you will find a, a deep quiet when people are not around. But from well before sunrise to late in the night, thousands and thousands of people from all over India and other countries also. Um, and there is noise and chanting and ringing of bells and people, um, you know, so and rituals and various kinds of rituals going on. There are yogis sitting and meditating, not all for enlightenment. Some are there. I have met some like that. Uh, one I knew who was meditating uh, there for intensely. And I thought he was, he was amazing. Uh, but it turned out he was meditating for occult powers, siddhis. You know, the ability to read someone's mind, to float up in the air or so and so forth. Uh, I remember this person, he was, he was extremely austere. And I thought, wow, he's practicing so hard, far more than me. And then one day I heard, I heard our senior Swami scolding him very sharply and then sent him away. And we asked later what happened. He said uh, that young man had come. He was sitting in the temple for the last several months and practicing very intense um, austerities meditation. Uh, and then finally he came very happily and told the Swami this his uh, the extra some extraordinary power he had developed, and the Swami just uh, you know yelled at him, <laughs> scolded him so harshly. So there are some there are yogis who are meditating. There are there are um, babies who have been born there for their first tonsure of the hair, hair. There are married couples who have come there for blessings just after marriage. There are Brahmin priests. There are simple villagers from all across speaking various languages. I mean, uh, you just have to imagine the scene in a, in a traditional Indian temple. In the midst of that, that storm of activity and sound, uh, the whole temple is pervaded by unmistakable spiritual depth. And when you go into the, the Garbhagriya, the, 
the uh, inner sanctorum it's tiny and there's a constant shoving and people reaching out to touch the shivalinga there which is in the center um, and pour water and put offerings there and you can hardly go there for a few seconds before you're shoved aside and pushed out of the place um, but I, at this time I, I did what i usually do there I go there and do the ritual as quickly as possible, within seconds. And as I'm a monk, I'm given a little more time. And then I go quickly to the side, to a corner of that little stone chamber. And then I stand there. You can't sit. You'll be trampled if you sit there. So you can stand in a corner and I repeat the mantra or just try to meditate. And immediately, just like that, in the midst of all that shoving and hubbub and immediate. Uh, we, uh, you know, the stillness and the effortless manifestation of the divine there. That takes place straight away there. And it's unforgettable each time. So, Vibhavati Esha Atma. So, he, say, you know, he says here, uh, the uh, enlightened one, people go to these temples for everything. for uh, Mostly for worldly purposes, but also for uh, spiritual realization. The enlightened one can grant all of that. Tam tam lokam jayate tangsh chakaman. Whatever is, comes in the mind of the enlightened one, um, that one, the enlightened one can get and can give. Can give. That one, does, the enlightened one doesn't want. Like Shiva doesn't want any of it. He's constantly granting boons to millions and millions of people for thousands and thousands of years. And none of it, Shiva wants none of it. You can easily grant. And Shiva's another name is Ashutosha, the one who is easily pleased. So easily pleased means just a little ritual, a little prayer, and uh, maybe you will get what you want. So he says the enlightened one is like that. Tam tam lokam jayate chakaman. If the desire which you have, you uh, serve the enlightened one, and if the enlightened one so wants, your desire will be fulfilled. It just has to arise in the mind of the enlightened one. Tasmad Atmagyam hi achayet bhuti kamaha. Atmagyam, the enlightened one, self-realized one, the one who has realized the self, I am Brahman, such, one, such a one. Achayet, worship, adore. Bhuti kamaha. Here it says, the one who wants worldly prosperity. If you want enlightenment, yes. If you want worldly stuff, as millions and millions of billions do, uh, even that will be granted if you uh, revere such a one. So that is behind the great reverence shown to sadhus, holy people in uh, India. It's part of the culture in Hinduism and beyond Hinduism, in Buddhism, Jainism, Sikhism, which doesn't have monks. But I've seen Sikh, Sikhs are so respectful of Hindu monks, so respectful. I've seen this in the Himalayas and in the plains of India. Uh, so why? Uh, one reason is this one. Atmagyam hi achayet bhuti kama. For those who want something in this world, it could be a pretty worldly desire. But yes, uh, you, you will. It's it's possible that you, you will get it if you revere the uh, holy person. Uh, another way of explaining this is it is said that the uh, enlightened one, the holy one, has got enormous karmic credit because this person has given up evil ways, bad things for a long time, maybe lifetimes, has struggled to become a moral person. So does not do evil, does not do anything wrong for uh, maybe uh, years and decades, maybe even lifetimes. So no bad karma and does good to people, which gives rise to good, really good karma. And worships God, practices spiritual disciplines, which also gives rise to very good karma. And so has enormous amounts of good karma, but which the enlightened one does not want to use. It is nothing to that enlightened one. So what happens is that those who worship the enlightened one, they get the result of that good karma. That's one way of showing from the karmic calculus angle. How is it possible that, you know, Fulfilling desires requires you to have lots of good karma. Where does this good karma come from? If you just revere an enlightened one, because they are really good people. So they have enormous amounts of good karma. And also the downside of it is, 
if they have any bad karma left over. Uh, so those who hurt or malign or act against an enlightened one, they will not do anything. They are absolutely harmless. They will not do anything for, to you. Uh, they are absolutely harmless. But um, the vengeance comes from God or from the accumulated bad karma. So those who seek to hurt or uh, you know, malign an, uh, a holy person, so the good, the bad karma affects them. And those who revere and serve the holy person, the good karma comes to them. This is from the karmic perspective. From the God perspective, so the, such people are protected by God. So they don't protect themselves, enlightened ones, they do not protect themselves. They have nothing against anybody. A person could harm them with impunity as far as they are concerned. But never ever try to do that. Be very, very careful around these people uh, because they're protected by divinity itself. Um, the difference is between, in another way, between Shiva and Shakti. So Sri Ramakrishna is to say, you can say whatever you want to me, but be careful of that one. He, was, he would point to the Nahabat where the Holy Mother uh, stayed. If she is hurt or annoyed by you, she, he would say, Brahma, Vishnu, Maheshwara cannot save you. Even the greatest of the gods cannot, cannot save you. So Shakti, one should be uh, very careful. Um, so, yes. Atmagyam hi archayit bhuti kama. Those who want enlightenment, they should revere, definitely revere the spiritual master and they do. But those who want worldly prosperity also, they just have something to attain in the world. Uh, it's a very good thing. Uh, and and very uh, very good uh, bet, you know, wager, because your expenditure is very little, and the gain can potentially be enormous. That you see throughout the uh, culture in India, as I said, Sikhs and Buddhists and Jains, and of course all Hindus. There's always a culture of revering a holy person. You don't know who is uh, enlightened. Funny story. Um, there is. So a monk comes up, as, as is even now the custom in uh, Uttaranchal, in the Himalayan regions, in a village, to a household, to a farmer's house on the mountain sides, and uh, begs for food. And the lady of the house goes and gives him, him food. And the husband is, doesn't like it. And he yells and says, why are you wasting our food and giving it to these, um, you know, these holy beggars, these wanderers? They're no good. You're just wasting our food. And she says, it's not wasted. If he is enlightened, then all our we'll get all the blessings. And uh, you know, if he's a truly holy person, uh, we'll get all the blessings uh, and our desires will be fulfilled and we'll be happy. And if he's not enlightened, then he will become a bullock in, and, and plow our fields in his next birth. <laughs> so there is no meaning there's no free lunch. <laughs> so it is on the side of the begging monk. It's incumbent upon him to, to work really hard at his spiritual practices. Uh, otherwise, he will incur a huge karmic debt from the food he begs from, you know, these poor villagers. Okay. So that brings us to a close um, of the first section of the last chapter, third chapter of Mundaka Upanishad. Now it remains only the final section remains, which is also a very beautiful section. The concluding section of the Mundaka Upanishad. Quickly look at the comments. Brinda says, it's my mind, it's my understanding. Mind is nothing but flow of thoughts. Does pure mind mean that there are no thoughts? Minus thoughts, it's only consciousness. Yes, it is true, but also it's not just thoughts. There are uh, vasanas, what one might today call the subconscious mind, conditioning. Notice, it's not just thoughts. We are susceptible to particular kinds of thoughts, particular kinds of desires and negativities, uh, which are which are our mind has been conditioned to. So those only those thoughts, desires, the uh, fixed patterns of thinking, grooves. It, it, so the mind is not fresh. It's it's highly conditioned. Those conditions have to be cleared up. Those con that conditioning has to be purified. How do you know it's purified? Then the thoughts which arise in the mind, spiritual thoughts, positive thoughts will come much more easily. Negative thoughts, worldly thoughts will slowly fade away. The pull of the world will uh, slowly fade away. 
you don't find it all that interesting or attractive or scary or anxiety producing anymore uh, so yes girish says your recent lecture on universe as seeing is there a parallel to be drawn between madhyamaka all things exist only in relationship to others and drishti shrishti existence is only in relation to ship to seeing yes um, actually um there's a parallel they're not saying the same thing relationship uh, existence is only in relationship to seeing that is much closer to the the yogachara school of mahayana buddhism yogachara is like the sister school of the madhyamaka they are they are rival sisters so they always fight among each other the emptiness people and the mind only yogachara is the mind only vigyanavada mind only school and the madhyamaka is the emptiness school so these two are sort of very sophisticated schools and they are all living schools because um, mahayana buddhists are practicing buddhists tibetan buddhists have been um, developing these philosophies for more than the last 1000 years so they're very sophisticated philosophies and among them the mind only school would hold on to this existence is in relationship to seeing existence is dependent on seeing but in a different sense than from the vedantic uh, the advaitic idea of drishti shrishti but the drishti shrishti of, of of advaita vedanta is close to the mind only school of buddhism everything exists in relationship that is the emptiness school so like two bales of hay leaning on each other the subject and the object the seeing and the seen the hearing and the sound they lean on each other without sound there's no hearing without hearing there's no sound this like this and by the way i was i'm reading right now this book um carlo rovelli's helgoland on quantum mechanics on quantum physics and there towards the end he goes into nagarjuna and the emptiness school he says when i'm talking about understanding quantum physics as relationships his he says the basic idea the interpretation of quantum physics which he favors and here i'm repeating what he says because i am far far from being any kind of uh, having any kind of expertise in quantum physics so he says that things do not exist in themselves what are things then what we call things what are things then they are interactions they uh, things and properties are revealed only in interactions with each other so that sounds crazy because we think things exist books uh, people sky earth all of that exists he says it exists only in relationship to each other and he says when i speak like this people tell me have you read nagarjuna and he said finally i thought i should give it a try and he read uh, nagarjuna's the verses on the uh, middle way the mula madhyamaka karika and he was stunned he says and he read the commentary he says with an american uh, analytic philosopher j garfield whom i studied madhyamaka under at harvard and he says i was stunned there is this buddhist master more than 2000 years ago in india uh, who is with such clarity talking about what i am talking about today not that he is very clear he says not that the buddhist master knew quantum physics not at all he was not talking about quantum physics he was talking about the philosophy of interdependence and the empty nature of things and that's a way to understand quantum physics the best way to understand quantum physics today he says by the way i was watching a debate among some of the top experts in consciousness studies today uh, three experts the one is patricia churchland another one is bernardo castro and third one is carlo rovelli this writer of uh, helgoland is an italian quantum physicist so three of them and the first one patricia churchland her view is consciousness is nothing but the brain the physical body the body nervous system brain that generates consciousness a completely physicalist materialist explanation of consciousness or trying to explain consciousness that's one view the exact opposite view is held by bernardo castro bernardo castro says he he's a computer scientist and also a, he has got i think a double phd in computer science and in analytic philosophy so he says there's no physical reality physical reality is ultimately mental reality or it is consciousness consciousness itself is appearing as this universe so an idealist perspective 
that the mind is appearing at this universe. So it does not make such a clear difference between consciousness and mind. It is ultimately it's a mental reality. It's mind which is appearing as that. And then you have um, Carlo Rovelli. He says it's neither matter nor mind. It is relationships. And these things are empty in themselves. All that is these interactions between these empty natured things if that makes any sense. That's what's creating this universe. All right. So three views. Matter creates this universe. Matter, this universe is matter. Second view, just the opposite. It's not matter. It's mind. And the third view is neither matter nor mind. It is relationships. I was just thinking, who are these people? These are the cutting edge thinkers in the 21st century world. One is a physicalist. One is an idealist. And one is what? quantum physicist um, using the relationships interpretation of, of uh, quantum theory. Three, exactly the same positions were held nearly 2,000 years ago in ancient India. There were the materialists, uh, Jarvakas, Lokayatas, who held the universe is matter, never changing. There were the mind-only school, which we just spoke about. The universe is just mind. And there were these uh, emptiness people, the Madhyamakas, who said the universe is just relationships and empty in itself. In principle, exactly the three positions. <laughs> Dimitri says, could you elaborate on the reflection? Who is the observer? The reflection, uh, the observer or the subject in our day-to-day -day interactions, right now, the subject, according to Advaita Vedanta, is pure consciousness, Reflected in or limited by. These are the two uh, theories. Pratibhimbavada, avachedavada. Two reflection theory, limitation theory. Pure consciousness reflected in, again as if. Pure consciousness limited as if by the mind. So, um, what's the subject? The subject is the mind, I right now, but illumined by pure consciousness. So, the subject is... Really speaking, is pure consciousness. In practice, it is a mind with the reflected consciousness. I'll repeat that. The subject, what you're calling the observer, is really speaking pure consciousness. Without pure consciousness, no observer is possible. But it is in practice, right now, for practical purposes, it is mind channeling, reflecting, limiting that pure consciousness. What is what is moonlight? What, what's, what's illumining the earth at night? It's moonlight. Really, it is sunlight. But it is reflected of the moon. It bounces off the moon as it were. And then comes and illumines the earth. What's the name of the poem? The brain is wider than the sky. Yes. John is asking. In a still mind, awareness is reflected clearly. Then the vrittis arise and modify the mind. The awareness then exists along with the modified mind. Awareness remains unchanged in a modified mind. Viveka arises to discriminate or separate awareness from the vrittis. Is discrimination separating awareness or awareness, mind from awareness or awareness from mind? Um, I don't see the difference, but I'll go back to what you said earlier. Still, mind awareness is reflected clearly. Yes, but notice you have contradicted it a little later. You say awareness remains unchanged in a modified mind. So is it still reflected clearly or not? Or is it unchanged? You're saying it's unchanged. So that means it's still clearly reflected. And you are right. You're right. Here is a crucial uh, point of um, difference between Patanjali Yoga and the traditional Advaita. Patanjali Yoga says the stillness of the mind, purity of the mind and stillness of the mind is essential. And in that still pure mind, pure consciousness is appreciated for what it is. Therefore, one needs to purify and still the mind in yoga, in samadhi, in yogic samadhi. When you have blanked out the world, when you have lost consciousness of the body, and you, the mind is stilled like a lake without any movements, in that still pure mind, you, the pure consciousness, you become aware of your clear nature, of your nature as this limitless awareness. That is yoga. Advaita Vedanta is what you say here. He says, discrimination between, this discernment between the um, mind and consciousness. 
So that discernment, it's not stilling the mind. It's quieting the mind. And as Shankaracharya says, Dhyayamanaha, meditating, he says, Anuchintayam, reflecting on or um, staying with your clarity. Listen to Vedanta, reason it out. Once you've got it, stay with it. This is the discernment or discrimination. My awareness from, I would say the language I would use is awareness from mind because you are my, you are awareness, you are not mind. So you see the distinction between yourself and the mind. Right now it's not clear, right now it seems to be mixed up. Yes, we are all, we all claim to be aware, but we, this is always mixed up with the mind. There is some thought or feeling or an absence of a thought going on. The difference is not clear to us. The clarity will also come in the mind. The clarity will also come in the mind. The pure consciousness is neither obs uh, obscure in itself, nor does it require clarity. It's always blazing forth. And the veiling is in the mind, and the removal of the veil also will come in the mind. And the clarity, I am this, will also come in the mind. But then you are freed of the mind itself. Brahma, Ralph Waldo Emerson, very famous. There are actually verses from Kathopanishad here in that, that uh, poem, Brahma. Yes, Gita also, Kathopanishad and Gita, same, same verses. Sonali says, Palabhyati is not necessary. It can be said that the reflected consciousness collapses into pure consciousness. Mind goes dark and pure consciousness that we are shines like a dark sun. Yes, yes. That's a good way of putting it. It's very subtle. Those who haven't studied Vedanta and done the discernment, they will find all this language mysterious, what is it trying to say. But when you look inside, see, um, let me point out something I forgot to point out. The ninth mantra, which we did today, this subtle mind, this subtle Atman, Esho Anuratma, Chetasa Veditabhya, Smin Prana, Panchadha, Sambhivesha. Here in this body, where the prana with its five-fold functions pervades, consciousness pervades the entire mind and sensory system. That has to be realized. The process has been indicated here. I had said I would point out the process, I forgot. Uh, the process has been indicated. Start with the body. Go to the breath, then to the senses, then to the mind, and then to consciousness itself. So how do you do that? You sort of relax and then become aware of the body. You can see the body, you close your eyes, you can feel the sensations of the body. Then he says, Yasmin prana. Go to the prana. The best way to go to the prana is the breath. Notice the in-breath at the no nostrils. You can start with the stomach, which rises and falls. Then go to even more, you know, go means put your attention, note the inflow of breath at the nostrils, then the outflow of breath at the nostril, nostrils. Do this for maybe 10 counts, so that the mind also gets steadied. We are interiorizing the mind. We have gone from the world to the body to the breath, prana. Then go from the breath to the senses. Um, notice the feeling of uh, the warmth in the breath coming here at the nostril, the sensation of the body. Uh, so and the senses itself. You can even open your eyes and take a look around and notice how forms are being perceived. Then close the eyes again and notice, the, go from the senses to the mind, the thoughts, the memories, the various ideas popping in and out of existence in the mind. Then notice that you are aware of all of this, that there is the reflected consciousness which pervades the mind and the senses. This is all sentient. This is all in, happen, happening in awareness. And then go, quote unquote, go from there to the original consciousness, which is you. It's like going from the mirror. First of all, you fo focus on the mirror, then focus on the face reflected in the mirror, and then go, go again, quote unquote, go from the reflected face in the mirror to your real face. Like that. Abhijit says, Oh, it's a conversation with Ramana Maharshi. The question is, if I also be an illusion, then who casts of the illusion? Uh, Ramana Maharshi says, the I casts of the illusion of I and yet remains as I. Such is the paradox of self-realization. The realized do not see any contradiction in it. And it's absolutely clear. Yes, for, for the enlightened person, this is very straightforward. 
But for the rest of us, it sounds very contradictory. <laughs> How can the I, you know, cast off the I and yet remain the I? So this is the first line of the Nirvana Shatakam. Mano buddhi hankara chittani naham. In the first line itself, Shankaracharya says, the mind, the intellect, the memory, and the ego I is not I. The I is not I. How? Then Bhargava Teja says, as discussing and arguing with my roommate on enlightened person in terms of physical materialistic evidence, I mentioned Brahma, Karavitti and arguing that there should be some kind of physical manifestation of the brain as every knowledge and thought creates a neuronal path. And we can probably see the evidence of it as a sophisticated tool. Maharaj, do you think it holds any water? It should. Technically, it should. And you'll be interested to know that someone like Swami Trigunati Tananda, direct disciple of Sri Ramakrishna, who was um, in the Vedanta Society of, um, of Northern California in San Francisco, uh, he was firmly convinced that the brain, the physical, the brain itself uh, of the enlightened one, of the Jivan Mukta, is there, will be, there should be appreciable differences in that compared to the brain of the, um, uh, of the ordinary person. And he said, uh, after I die, preserve my brain. Nobody did that. <laughs> so you should preserve my brain. So one day scientists will be able to study it. But now we have some indication. So for example, um, there is a vast amount of literature already in psychology and neuroscience about the effects of prolonged meditation on the brain. And so thanks to the Dalai Lama, who uh, offered some of his advanced Lama practitioners for um, you know, brain scans, MRI scanning, fMRI scanning. And there is uh, enough evidence now. There are papers and books which have been published. The advanced meditators, those who have been doing serious meditation for years, for decades, um, you can clearly see it in their behavior. And you can, it seems you can clearly see it in their brain functioning also. So a, a very significant difference from the, uh, from the average. So if that's true for advanced practitioners, it should be even more true for the enlightened one. Uh, if someone does a bad deed unknowingly, is it forgiven by Thakur? Certainly. Always, if I be say, I, uh, I have done something wrong and I confess it to you, my Lord, and I shall not do it. It's important. I shall not do it again. I, one might say, I might do it again. I don't trust myself. All right. At least promise, I shall sincerely try not to do it again. Then also one gets for forgiveness. All right. Om Shanti 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 Hari Om Tat Sat Shri Ram Krishna Arbanamastu.